Three Women is a book that has created quite a buzz already. A lot of people talking about it. There's something I suppose slightly strange about me as a man talking to you about this book, which is very much about three women and about female desire. But I wanted, if we could, to kind of go back to you creating this book. It's taken you eight years, mm -hmm. lots of conversations with these women, but you didn't know it was going to end up being about female desire when you first started. Uh, I, I wanted to talk to men, and I did, but I never wanted it. Um, it started with this uh, notion of following the path of Gay Talese's Thy Neighbor's Wife, which was taking the pulse of sexuality in the late 70s and early 80s. And there was a lot of sex in it um, and it was very immersive I was I was very admiring of both aspects the immersiveness in particular because he spent about a decade on it as well and immersed himself very much and um, but but what I was more interested in that I didn't find there was the the emotion behind the acts it felt very act oriented and I was wondering, you know, for example, in swinging situations where a woman and her partner, where the woman would watch her partner having sex with other men and vice versa, I was interested in how that would make someone feel. Mm. You mentioned there about the idea of the swinging. So that's Sloane, who's one of the, the three women that you, you speak yes. about. Let's look at Sloane because that relationship with her husband, who is, who's a chef, and it, it's kind of at his insistence. It's his idea that she sleep with other men. And... One line that seemed particularly telling to, to me, which is actually near the end of her story, um, when she's confronted by the wife of somebody that she slept with, and she says, you were the woman, you had the power. Mm -hmm. She said, you had the power, you had the control. Mm -hmm. And I thought she didn't, though, because I was worried that she wasn't ever really in control or having the power because it was her husband. Is that a fair assessment? Or how would you feel after having spent so much time with her? I, I don't, I mean, I don't think anything's an unfair assessment, but... What I, I mean, everyone has their own takes, and I, I like to hear different takes. What I, what I thought, you know, a lot of people, let me just um, segue for a moment. A lot of people said to me that, why didn't you, why didn't you feature any happy marriages? And so, you know, one reason is because a happy marriage is kind of boring, at certain <laughs> point, something narratively compelling. Yeah. Yes, there's little nuance, things that happen, but Sloane's marriage was two things. One, a very happy marriage, genuinely, and two, a an aberrant one and I think you know it's aberrant from the traditional it doesn't mean there's anything wrong with it but I was compelled mm. to hear more about it and the same thing that I you know heard in uh, Mr. Talese's book the swinging aspect but the the lack of the sort of depth of it was what I was so excited to hear about from Sloan um, and you know secondarily I, I do think she had a lot of power she was confused about her place in the world because of the way that women judge each other. She was confused because she didn't always like the men that her husband chose. At the same time, if she had said, I don't want to do that, he wouldn't have said, you have to, or I'm, I'm not happy yeah. at all. But she did it to please him. And she talked about how much he did to please her and how he said to her every day that you are my fantasy. And I think that, I mean, I, I don't think there's a person in the world who wouldn't want their partner to think that they're their sexual fantasy mm. so you know uh, so yes I do think she had the power and I think she thought she had the power too and when the woman said that to her it was a sort of like it was chilling because she kind of realized that she could have she could have taken it she could have said uh, you know she did have agency she was she was the star of the show but she also was afraid of the men being found out. So it was two things going on. And with her, it was always this confusion of, of always having been raised to be perfect at everything, at riding horses, at modeling. And now all of a sudden she had to be perfect in the bedroom and perfect with how this woman was going to, you know, feel after, after she found out. Sloan is obviously, a, is not her real name, but there is a name in there. The story of Maggie is, is something that you can look up online because it was part of a court case. Mm -hmm. So Maggie and, and her teacher, Aaron Knodel, Knodel that, that court case ended up with him being cleared effectively. Mm -hmm. So did you feel that this book and, and telling her story was an opportunity to, to sort of, well, I say tell the truth because there's, there's no doubting what she, what she says. Did you, was that a huge responsibility to kind of get that part across? What I wanted to do was not so much say, this is terrible, this is what he did, and this is 
the truth. I wanted to tell Maggie's version mm. and in detail because I think that detail, the fact that the detail had not happened in the trial, the fact that detail rarely comes out in trials, and when people are wrongfully convicted or wrongfully acquitted, uh, and I'm not saying that one or the other happened, but I do, I do think that the the nuance is so important to any to any you know she said he said or she said she said etc. Mm. Lena completes our, our trio of women who is someone who is stuck in a, a pretty sort of um, loveless marriage certainly mm-hmm. a sexless marriage and therefore does that classic thing of, of hooking up with somebody through through social media finds yes. you know the old, um, the old college boyfriend yeah. <laughs> um, and again. It, it felt to me as though she was somebody who was never quite in control of that situation. It was always on his terms, and mm-hmm. he's quite dismissive of her, but she just is very happy to take what she can get. Mm-hmm. Lena, someone said something to me that is what I felt, and I was quite moved by it, because she said, you know, to, this woman, a uh, journalist, said to me, you know, I think Lena had the most agency, in a sense, of the three of them, because... You know, she wanted to do this. She wanted, she said she was going to leave her husband after three months, and then she did. Mm. She said, if you don't touch me for, she didn't say that to him, but she was like in her head three months, and it was like the day of the, the you know, the third month being up. Um, she was, she I want, I want, I want a separation. And then the other thing she did was she wanted to sleep with this man. She wanted to feel those things that she had not ever felt really. And, and she, you know, the woman who said she had agency said, you know, this woman who doesn't have a lot of money, who doesn't, you know, was able to like pull babysitters out of a hat, change cars, you know, make gasoline work, buy a, a charger in a gas station, just like sort of put all these things together to get this. And, you know, I think, you know, you can look at it as pathetic. I don't. I think it's, there's sad elements, obviously, but there's also high passion and there's also probably more than she'd experienced in her whole life and might ever again. Mm. So, And there's no, there's no doubting the strength of the emotion and, as you say, the passion, the desire in all three of these women, even mm-hmm. though they all have very different yeah. stories. Um, I, I think women reading the book, I am sure, will see that and they will recognize it. And relate to it and I wonder whether you see this as book uh, as a book being for female readers only or what you hope male readers might get out of it of course I asked this as the male reader who got no, a huge I, amount from it I, I um I like the question a lot and my one of the early male readers who read it and I've said this so many times but I'm it's so it was so um vital and, and so I'm so happy to hear it he said to me until I read your book I didn't realize how indifference could be so wounding mm. And that to me was so striking and so wonderful because I wanted to convey that one too. I think Lena wanted that more than anything for him to just understand that if he had just written one word back to her after two weeks of waiting, that she wouldn't have been in such agony. Mm. And I think that that's, you know, we are owed that when we are in an intimate relationship or a business relationship with someone, unless we've done someone terrible, something terrible to the person, we are owed the person saying, hey, I've seen your email, I've seen your text message, I will get back to you, but I see you. And that's, you know, so the indifference of that, I hope that men or whoever is the sort of, you know, alpha person in the relationship, because it could be anyone, to say, you know, I, indifference is cruel. And just being able to pick up whenever you want, you know, like I always think of, you know, men mostly who don't call or write to a woman after weeks. And then, you know, one day at like 11 p.m., it's like, you up? You know, and I always think about that. And it's, you know, it's just so, and I was talking to my friend the other night. She was like, I had that happen at midnight. And I waited one minute and at 12.01, I was like, yeah, where are you? And there's also that part in Fleabag when like, you know, the guy says to, um, to Fleabag, he's like, you know, uh, are you basically, are you up? And she's like, oh yeah, I was just coming home from the bar. She's like in, you know, clearly at home. She like goes up, like dresses herself up. And it, that's, you know, that's, that's, it's funny because it's true. Yeah. I feel as though there's kind of a bit of a golden age of female nonfiction writing at the moment because of the honesty with which mm-hmm. you're writing. Um, 
But I realise, of course, especially with your book, that it is only possible probably for these three women to have shared so many details of their personal lives with another woman. Do you think it would only have been possible that way around? I, I do, because I think that with any, um, when two heterosexual or two homosexual people are people of a, a gender that would like the other gender in any way, I think that there's... There, like with many of the men I spoke to, there was definitely an ego on their part, including my own brother. It doesn't have to be, you know, because I spoke to him for the book at one point. It was an ill-advised decision because <laughs> now he still tells me things, like as though I'm reporting it okay. on him. So we need to get out of that. Maybe he'll watch this. And No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Not. Um, but, yeah, so I think that there's that going on that is, you know, it's it's easier to talk to someone of the same gender, that you're not trying to kind of, not, not trying, but not, you know, there's a, that element of bravado mm. is, is not there. And a corollary to that is that my fact checker on the book was a gay man. And, you know, he found it, it uh, you know, I asked the women, is it okay that it's a man? Then I said, you know, it's a gay man. So that might, so they were like, yeah, totally. But I also, you know, Sloan, for example, was like, they got a, he talked to her for hours about just, you know, he had got a kick out of it. And I do wonder if it were a heterosexual man, if she had been more, like, I think that she was more naturally, hmm. you know, with, so I just, I do think it depends. I think for the purposes of, I think Sloan would have probably told a gay man more. Like during, so I just think it, but yes, with the other two, I, I think that a woman's the only way it would have worked. Well, whether it, you're a female reader or a male reader, I think there's just so much to get from this book. So Lisa, thank you so much for spending eight years writing it. Thank you. Thank you for having me.